it's really rare for an athlete to actually share a real concrete piece of their medical history, especially with this on social media. So when I saw Andy Murray post an actual picture of his x-ray after he had his hip surgery, I knew this was an opportunity to make a really helpful video for you guys. What's up everybody, welcome back for those new. My name is Brian and I'm a doctor and a sports fan and it's my goal here to combine those two interests to help look at different sports injuries and sports medicine topics to try and help explain them to you so you can learn a little bit more about what's going on. Even if you're not a tennis fan or if you don't play tennis at all, this is a type of injury that can happen in any athlete regardless of their sport and has happened in athletes, especially in the NBA. So what we're gonna do today is take a look at Andy Murray's hip injury, we're gonna talk about what might have been going on to cause him these problems for so many years. We'll take a look at the anatomy of the hip to help try and get a sense of why he might have needed to have this surgery. And then we'll kind of break down what the implications are for his career as he tries to consider whether or not he's gonna come back to play. As usual, hit that subscribe button if you wanna see more of these videos and let's get started. Now there's a lot of speculation about what type of injury he might have had and the general consensus out there seems to be that he had some sort of hip impingement or ephemeracetabular impingement syndrome. If you've seen my video on Isaiah Thomas, he had a very similar thing, but was treated a different way. So I don't know exactly if that's what led to all this with Murray, but it's a reasonable enough thought that we're gonna take a quick minute to explain what could be going on in a hip impingement syndrome. So of course we have kind of the bowl of the pelvis or our big hip bones, the ilium on the outside. We have our sacrum, which is the lower part of our spine, the bottom parts of our lumbar vertebrae up here. And then of course we have the top portions of our femurs and the hip joints on either side. Real quick, I'm gonna throw up a picture of Murray's x-ray overlaid on top of this so that you guys can see how this anatomy relates to the actual x-ray itself. What can happen in the case of hip impingement is we get a buildup of excessive bone either on the rim of the cup or the socket or on the actual femur itself. It's something called a cam deformity or a pincer deformity. A pincer deformity is when there's more buildup of bone on the socket and a cam deformity is when there's more buildup of bone on the ball of the femur. What I've put on here next is some blue yarn to help represent the labrum. So we've heard about the labrum in the shoulder. We also have a labrum in the hip and it's this rim of soft tissue that's sort of an extension of the cartilage in the hip socket that wraps all the way around the rim of that socket and serves multiple functions, one of them being to help kind of secure and provide some suction to keep that hip in place. What I've done next here is I've added on this little bunch of tape here to simulate buildup of bone. So this is an example of what we would call a cam deformity. Now on our normal side over here, you can imagine as a player is moving, running their leg around, everything moves pretty smooth in that joint. But if I suddenly have a big buildup of bone right there, you can imagine how that's gonna have a much easier time getting pinched and kind of jamming up against the rim of that socket. And that's what's happening in hip impingement syndromes. Either too much bone on the femur or too much bone on the socket cause the joint to get pinched. The long-term implications of that, of course, are you can get damage to this labrum. And eventually if you damage the labrum enough, you can actually get damage to the cartilage that's protecting those joint surfaces. The problem with these impingement syndromes is over time you can get so much breakdown of the cartilage that you can develop early arthritis. And there's no real good cure for arthritis beyond actually getting rid of the bone and putting in a replacement. Now, since Murray showed us his x-ray, I can't not go through his x-ray with you guys to explain what these different things are. So first of all, right off the bat, when you look at the picture, you're gonna think, oh, this thing in the hip is on the left side. Well. X-rays are flipped, and so that actually is his right side. We can identify the two femurs on the outside, we can see the pelvis, we can pick up part of the spine as well, and then the components that we have over here are the actual metal prosthetics. The top part is the cup, that's the new acetabulum or the new socket, and the bottom part is the new femoral head component. Let's talk about the difference between a total hip replacement and a resurfacing like Murray had. In a full hip replacement, you can think of it as being more aggressive or more bone is removed and taken out. What they'll usually do is they'll put a fresh socket in that's either plastic or metal, but typically plastic, to provide a better smooth surface for that ball of the femur to rotate. But then what they do is they'll cut across and actually remove this whole chunk of your femur and the femoral head and replace it with a metallic prosthetic. So you've lost a good chunk of your native bone and whenever that happens, you lose a lot of your normal range of motion and your biomechanics of your hip joint are different. Now what some smart surgeons figured out was, well, maybe instead of replacing this whole section of bone, we could just replace the cup and just kind of put a new cap or put a new hat 
on the femur. So they came up with this idea of hip resurfacing where what they're trying to do is just provide some resurfacing of the portions of the joint that are moving. So they'll go in and they'll ream out the cup or that acetabulum, the socket, and they'll put a metal cup in its place. And then what they'll do is they'll cut down this part of the femur and they'll put a metal cap or a new femoral head on top of it. The benefits of doing that second resurfacing procedure like Murray had is you save a lot of your own bone. You're not cutting off this whole part of the femur. You're just removing and resurfacing the ball or the head of the femur. So all of your biomechanics are much more preserved and you have much better range of motion. That's a huge reason why these hip resurfacing procedures are becoming more and more popular, especially in younger people and in active athletes. If you get your entire hip replaced, you can't move as well. But if you only get the resurfacing done, you do have better range of motion. And so it's gonna be easier to do things like run, cut, play on a tennis court, and so on. So it's totally reasonable that someone like Murray would have this done. If there's some type of arthritis or wear and tear damage to those linings of the hip joint, you remove that bone, you put essentially a metal or a prosthetic joint in its place to hopefully get rid of the pain and overall improve his function. The final part of this is that challenging decision of whether or not someone like Murray can return to professional sports after having a surgery like this. Now the easy upfront answer is yes, he could return to playing tennis. The question is what are those long-term effects gonna be and how possible and feasible and safe is it for his health? A lot of research has been done looking at people who have complete total hip replacements and returning to sport. And we know that returning to athletics is not something that's completely prohibited after having your hip replaced. Of course, it's a bigger question in a younger athletic population that's having a hip resurfacing done because they are still young and active and wanna get back to their sport. So doctors have realized this and surgeons have done more research to try to figure out what the long-term effects might be and if it's dangerous or not for the athlete. A couple of the big things we think about with hip replacements in terms of the complications involve the fact that you've got metal hardware in your body. Just walking around, you're not putting all that much force through those two metal components, and so everything should be pretty stable and in place. What's a little more risky is when you do high-impact sports, so things like running, sprinting, playing tennis, cutting, playing basketball, activities where you're putting a lot more load through that hip joint, repetitive over and over again, there's a risk that those prosthetic components could become loose. If they become loose, you have to do revisions and it's really big and complex. And there's also been some talk about risk where those metal components rubbing together can cause some breakdown and release of metal into the body and what the effect of that might be. So to be totally honest, he's kind of in uncharted waters here. We don't have good long-term data to assess what the risk is whenever an athlete returns to a high impact sport like tennis after having one of these surgeries done. One fairly recent study tried to answer this question and so it followed one surgeon's patients who had hip resurfacing for a year and looked at whether or not they returned to their sports and then what sport it was. Overall, 98% returned to all impact sports combined and 82% had returned to what we consider high impact sports, which would include something like tennis. So it certainly is harder to come back to a sport like tennis than it would be to go back to say swimming or just even light running. Still not impossible. As it stands right now, it's really a decision between the surgeon and the patient to just decide between the two of them what those risks might be, and then to make sure they're doing the appropriate monitoring and follow-up to make sure no complications are developing. Functionally, he should be able to go out on a tennis court. It's gonna be a question of how they kind of risk stratify that process and just how he feels when he tries to go back out there and start playing. That's it, everyone. I hope you enjoyed kind of going off the usual and looking at an injury in a different sport. Hopefully there's tennis fans out there or people who just wanna learn more about these types of injuries. As always, leave any comments below. Let me know any questions you have or ideas for future videos. And until next time, thanks for watching and we'll see you later.